Hello and welcome to some more Star Citizen with a summary and highlights of the GameStar.de article Star Citizen Great Technique Analysis Is Star Citizen Technically Feasible? That is the title translated from German. They talked to various devs about a range of technical aspects of the game and there was some good information there. Be aware, some bits may be slightly lost in translation, as I have used uh, Google Translate and uh, chatting to some German friends on Reddit and my Discord to translate all this. Uh, if you'd like to support GameStar.de, I will put the uh, link below to the original article. Roadmap. So deadlines for the roadmap and features are deliberately made aggressive, which should ensure a stronger focus on particular and upcoming tasks. They are also able to push back features if they're not up to standard. And we actually can see that as I was recording this and I checked out ATV, they've split the 3.3 patch into 3.3, which is going to be released on October 10th, and 3.3.5, which is going to contain object container streaming and a load of features like that as well um, as soon as it's ready afterwards. Sometimes on the roadmap as well, there are similar names for tasks that are shown and displayed to us. Sometimes these may be the same task or incorporate parts of another task that's already shown. This is because the roadmap is pulled from CIG's internal JIRA project plan and sometimes this will effectively show duplicates with a different name or tasks that are dependent on each other or that um, tasks that share the same parts and tasks that are just identical but name something different by a different department. An example of this is object container streaming and network bind culling according to Clive Johnson who is the lead network work programmer at Foundry42. These techniques really are two sides of the same coin. The distinction made sense only because it clarified which teams would deal with specific tasks. In this case, actually both teams that were working on object container streaming and uh, network bind culling have actually been merged. The goal of object container streaming and network bind culling is that every single player or client uh, only has in its memory the entities that are relevant to them. The server instructs the client which entities it needs, then the client will receive appropriate updates on that entity, like changes of position. If this happens too early or late, errors can occur in the update process because the entity does not yet exist or the info is outdated. Network entity streaming is designed to solve that problem and make sure that clients always get updates for newly calculated entities when they need them. Clive Johnson was asked why don't they delete duplicated tasks or rename them all appropriately uh, as they change and like merge them together so the roadmap is I suppose more accurate and he said if we change the names or delete outdated tasks all together from the roadmap, then it might look like we're cancelling features. Of course, we're working to make the roadmap as accurate as possible, but the names of the various tasks are probably less important than the actual work we do to complete those tasks. That was sort of quite an interesting thing he said there, though, because he's basically saying that they can't make the roadmap perfectly accurate and merge um, items together and um, sort of like delete items from the roadmap if they've been subsumed into another task or whatever, because some people will just assume that they're, they've been removed. Those, those sort of like features have gone and um, whether they just delete something, people will just assume that's a feature gone and go, where's my feature? They also talked to principal gameplay engineer Steve Humphreys, who uh, talked about um, game code conversion and game object extension conversion. These two roadmap goals are about updating the old code to allow it to handle more tasks in parallel on background threads of the CPU. Much of the original gameplay code is based on Lua scripting language, which tends to only run on the main thread. In contrast, it's switching to C++, that code genuinely improves performance and allows code execution on multiple threads simultaneously. This should allow for more stable frame rates and much better efficiency of system resources. In regards to multi-threading, he also said they used to run most of the game code on a single main thread. Other threads were used for things like physics calculations, but with CPUs having more and more cores, it makes sense to spread more tasks over existing cores by using more threads in parallel and executing pieces of the game code on them. They want to distribute the tasks more evenly among their running threads. This applies to both the clients and the server. The best performance is going to be achieved by using as much as possible of all the CPU cores that your system has to offer. Um, Tony Zerovic um, talked about some stuff. He's the director of the Persistent Universe. Uh, he talked about their core tech, um, mostly. Uh, object container streaming and network bind culling also form an important basis 
for their next major challenge, which will be server meshing. Instead of using only one virtual server per instance of the game, several servers are supposed to share the corresponding tasks without the need for loading screens. Currently, the maximum number of players per server is 50, while in the past, four cores per server were used. The number of cores can now be dynamically adjusted in order to distribute the existing resources more efficiently. Server meshing will rely heavily on hardware from Amazon and their network infrastructure. Before they can even test server meshing, they need to complete various tech. This includes the specific backend services that control the distribution of servers, the smooth and seamless management of individual players across those different servers, and the dynamic definition of specific task areas that the servers will then each take over. Um, Tony Zorovec also states that they're working to get everything ready, but inevitably they will need to make adjustments to the systems if they're actually going to use a federation, a group of servers to administer a single instance rather than a single server looking after each instance as one server has only a limited view of the total amount of data potentially. He didn't commit to concrete player numbers on each server when the tech is first implemented, saying maybe a few times what a typical server supports. This could literally mean anything from, I suppose, 100 to 150 plus uh, player numbers will increase as they tweak and refine the tech. Individual server optimizations are key to this as well. They need to get as much juice out of each individual server as they can. Some AI stuff. The AI for the game is expanding. They want 90% of the population of the verse to be NPCs. So nine NPCs to every one player, meaning it will feel busy. The worry here is still performance. Uh, Tony Zorovic again said in his view, the AI would indeed be a major performance challenge, especially with regard to the servers. They are already working on various solutions to this though. These include optimizations to the code and better multi-threading, object container streaming, server meshing, all of that will also help. They will be using lightweight MPC entities and have a streamlined economic simulation in the form of subsumption, which handles loads of the AI stuff and all of the dynamic content. Tools and pipeline stuff, the feature teams they now have for specific mechanics and game dev enable them to be much faster and effective at creating the game and actually working on individual tasks. The tools and pipelines that they've developed are incredibly important. This will lead them to progress much quicker when moving forward. Some tasks are cut down to 10 or so minutes rather than hours that they were previously. Uh, again, Tony Zerich says players can already experience the tools for procedural creation of planets and moons in action, but there is still a large catalogue of features that they'd like to have in place to add to their tools. When creating Hurston, they created a, a point of interest list. So this includes the city of Lawville, outposts on the planet's surface, underground facilities, garbage dumps, loads of biomes and more. This tier zero list then gets supplemented with more content such as uh, more settlements, moving dealers, crash sites, mines and farms. The rest of the plant surface is going to be a mix of procedural generation and then some hand-placed assets. Lawville is a completely handcrafted location though with a specific kind of placement of buildings, um, shops, uh, areas for landing, that sort of stuff. It's very highly detailed and it's sort of like they've, they've made sure that it's been artist and handcrafted throughout. The points of interest in close proximity to Lawville will likely get more attention um, because they're going to be more visited. Even though a lot of their systems can procedurally generate and place like outposts, biomes and points of interest in general, they will give certain areas a bit more artist attention where sensible as procedural generation can have bits that don't look perfect and having an artist look over them and tweak them and add bits to them does enable them to get very high quality scenes and visuals um, and, and, and areas in general rather than just leaving it entirely to to chance with the procedural generation i suppose it's not chance but you know what i mean there's there's a higher degree of failure uh, of something looking great uh, when you just leave it to procedural generation, no matter how good that procedural generation system is. There was a little bit on object container streaming performance as well with Port Olisar in the current 3.2.2 build. There are a, about 70,000 entities that might need to be calculated without object container streaming, compared to only about 9,000 with object container streaming. However, object container streaming is not just about improving performance, but also enabling a denser population of NPCs, vehicles, ships, players, uh, detail assets, and general background activities.
Today's video is brought to you by F-Secure Total, premium cybersecurity for you and your devices. Want PC security, protection, or don't like the idea of being constantly monitored? F-Secure Total is for you. It includes safe and award-winning internet security suite, protecting you from ransomware viruses and while browsing the web. Freedom VPN, giving you net privacy, a way to access otherwise inaccessible content, while being secure and anonymous even on public Wi-Fi. Key, a password manager, allowing you to store your passwords securely and access them from any device. Total protects you and your device. You can try F-Secure Total, Internet Security and Privacy Suite free for 30 days. You can also use the code BoardGamer to get 20% off a subscription. Check out the links below for more information. Every month we have a ship giveaway, this time for September. It's a Sabre Raven, a game package, and a CitizenCon digital goodies pack. All you need to do to be in for a chance of winning is be subscribed to my YouTube channel and comment on any of my videos during the month. Thanks for watching, guys. I look forward to your comments. Take care, and I'll see you in the verse.